This video is all about port matching and porting or flowing two-stroke scooter engine cases. More specifically, I'll be showing you the process as I worked on the cases for my last board and stroked 103cc Chinese horizontal Minarelli clone, but the general ideas should apply to many engines. Before showing you the actual work, let's talk about what we're doing. Port matching is a pretty obvious term, because we're trying to get two ports or passages to match each other where they meet. In this instance, we're talking about matching the boost and transfer ports in the engine case to the boost and transfer ports of the cylinder's base. Port matching generally involves getting the entries and exits of ports to match up, as well as a little blending, because you wouldn't want to just cut away the very edge of a port and leave a lip elsewhere. That would make the whole process sort of pointless. This helps to keep the mixture flowing without running into ridges or sudden volume changes. Stock engine cases may also restrict port size when you move up to larger displacements or cylinder kits that rev higher and produce more power. In this example, I was building a 103cc from a set of 49cc cases, and you can see that there is a big difference in the stock port dimensions of the cases and the size of the cylinder's ports represented by the base gasket. Large changes in displacement like this, or racing cylinders, tend to create the biggest mismatch. More mild or stock cylinders may have very little mismatch. It's possible that a cylinder could even have smaller ports than the cases with stock replacements or very mild kits. That would likely be a very slight mismatch, and while the cases could be filled a little or the cylinder could be cut to match, leaving it as is may be just as good of an option. Porting or flowing cases can mean different things. Or maybe I should say can be taken to different levels. What most seem to mean here is that they are smoothing out the cases, essentially trying to get rid of sharp edges and make a better path from the reed area to the boost or transfer ports. Things like rounding off corners and blending to improve transitions. I take it beyond that with my engines, and I do what I have come to know as trenching from the people that introduced the concept to me. Trenching is another term that is somewhat obvious in meaning, as it involves essentially digging trenches in the engine cases. Mixture comes in through the reeds and makes its way to the cylinder via the transfers on the boost port. The idea of trenching is to create a path from the reed area more directly to the transfers, not just a path, but a path that remains clear even when the cylinder skirt, piston, or crank may block any sort of direct path from the reeds to the transfers. The idea of creating a direct path is fairly intuitive, as you generally don't want obstacles in any kind of pathway, be it a port with a lump of metal, or a hallway with a chair in the middle of it. When you consider that air or air and fuel mixtures have mass and momentum, it makes even more sense to try to direct the intake charge toward the transfers in the cylinder instead of crashing into the cylinder skirt, piston, crankshaft, or any other obstacle. Case trenching or flowing does not typically yield large gains. Stock and mild setups are least likely to benefit, while larger and more race-oriented builds are more likely to show improvement. I'm not sure that anyone has published dyno numbers or solid data to clearly illustrate any difference that casework may make. Identical setups would need to be used for such testing, with and without modifications in certain areas, and or before and after testing with no other changes. Most DIY enthusiasts do this work along with other mods, so gains are more of an assumption or hope than a recorded fact. To further complicate the situation, this kind of casework tends to add crankcase volume, and that could be responsible for improvements. Recent two-strokes don't rely so much on crankcase compression to move mixture as they once did, and now modern exhausts create enough suction to pull mixture from the cases and into the cylinder. It is even possible that the exhaust suction can open the reed valves and pull mixture from the carburetor. Adding the factor of crankcase volume makes it pretty tough to test in a way that would show any clear result specific to making a more direct path to the transfers, especially for someone like most of us that are working in their garage with limited time, tools, and budget. If anyone does know of test results specifically from certain casework, please post it in the comments because I'm sure a lot of us would like to see it. That said, one could gather that it's not just a wild idea without merit by taking a look at aftermarket offerings, or two-stroke engines that are more modern or designed for applications where performance is more of a priority than in the typical small scooter engine. 
Image searches for things like two-stroke porting or two-stroke racing engines should provide examples of engines that direct flow toward the transfers, even trying to shroud or separate the crank from the mixture as much as possible in some cases. Checking out high-end racing engine cases based on Minarelli and Piaggio scooter engines may be our best bet for some more relatable inspiration. 49ccscoot.com forum member Overse was kind enough to provide pics of his Melosi C1 cases for us. You can see that they cast their cases with a much more clear path toward the transfer ports than the typical stock scooter engine would have. They also formed a ramp into the transfers instead of the pocket with a sharp ledge that is common with stock scooter engines. Yamaha even made scooters with redesigned Minarelli engines at one point. They were in a few models worldwide, but they were in 2002 to 2005 Yamaha Vino 50s in the US. They were given a 5BM engine code that can be found on the cases and other engine parts as well as in part numbers. I bought a used 5BM engine to disassemble because I thought it was interesting and wanted to see it for myself and to share it with you. Again you can see that they create a pathway from where the reed valves sit to the transfer ports. Look at these corners of the transfer sections and you can clearly see that they're attempting to direct flow up and into the transfers and to eliminate dead spots. The 5BM cases even took it a step further with a redesigned reed block that aims flow from the reeds toward the transfers. The 5BM reed block doesn't fit more common horizontal Minarelli engines, but angled adapters can be used with standard reed blocks to achieve a similar effect. Up to this point, it seems like the risk that you'd take to do a major matching and trenching job would mostly be time and the usual porting issues, like going too far may make it worse rather than better. Removing a bunch of material could also put your cases at a much greater risk of failure. Most people that leave their cases alone, or do minor port matching and smoothing, won't have much trouble with cases cracking, but remove large portions of metal and you may be in for headaches immediately or sometime down the road. I've had at least a couple of cases that were severely ported suffer from cracking. I've also had cases that were ported that never gave me any trouble. It's just a risk that you should be aware of and should check for with pressure or leak testing periodically. The more aggressive you get with the cutting, the more likely it is that you'll have an issue at some point. Now I'm going to show you some clips from when I port matched and trenched a set of engine cases for my 103cc Big Bore Stroker Minarelli so you can see basically how the process goes. These were 49cc cases and were cut to accept the large cylinder and crank before what you'll see here. I do have videos up about cutting cases if that is of interest to you. The first thing that I do when I'll be porting cases like this is to backfill the areas where I'm likely to break through. If all you are going to do is a port match and a little smoothing, then this is not necessary, but if you plan to dig out trenches, this should be done. Even if you never see daylight through the case, you could have paper-thin walls left over, and it's way easier to fill before you cut through than after. Figure out the area that corresponds to where you'll be cutting, and then rough up the surfaces where you plan to use filler. I usually attack it with a carbide burr and or a scribe to create a bunch of imperfections and increase surface area, but some people prefer sanding with a coarse grit. Then get rid of any metal shavings and clean the cases. I used brake parts cleaner and then alcohol for this one, but I have since switched to acetone for my final cleaning. Once dry, block or cover any holes that you don't wish to fill in the area. I used masking tape to cover this threaded hole. Using a bolt could be bad because you may just get the bolt stuck in place with your filler material. A small portion of this tape will be stuck in there, but that's usually okay. Just don't cover a large area with tape or the filler won't be able to bond to the cases like it should. I used JB Weld for my filler, but there are other choices. Just make sure that whatever you use can withstand high temperatures, repeated heat cycles, and vibration. I used a different filler years ago and it was too brittle for the job and cracked quickly. It may be possible to use welding, brazing, or soldering to fill the cases, but then you run the risk of melting or warping the cases, so I would not advise that unless you are very experienced with that process. An epoxy filler like this will be much easier for most of us. Be sure to fill enough area to cover the cutting that you'll do later, but try not to go overboard. 
Follow the directions with your filler, but usually it's a good idea to allow at least 24 hours for curing before you touch the cases again. I would suggest doing both cases at once to speed up the process. After the filler was cured, I just ripped off the overhanging masking tape. You can see that some stays between the case and the filler in that small area, which is why you don't want to tape off too much. Then I bolt my cases together and install cylinder studs and the base gasket. This lets me see and mark any mismatch between my cylinder and the cases. It's important that the gasket that you use for this is well matched to the cylinder, so make sure you check how well the gasket matches before this step. You can use an X-Acto knife for gasket trimming if needed, and some gasket materials can be quickly modified with a burr and a rotary tool. Mark the area that needs to be cut away. I used a permanent marker, but you could use layout fluid and or scribe outlines onto the cases. Unless you're building a race engine or a 90cc plus from a 49cc, you probably won't see anywhere near this severe of a mismatch. Then I took the cases back apart to prep for material removal. You can see that I started grinding briefly before remembering to protect my cases. It's a good idea to put a layer or two of tape over any sealing surfaces. For thin tape like the masking tape that I used, I'd go with at least a couple of layers. It's easy to slip with a cutter and make contact with these critical areas, and masking can reduce the risk of scarring them. Then it's time to dig in. If you're doing port matching and trenching, there's no real specific order that you have to do it in. I chose to start with roughing out the trench area with a carbide burr. I would suggest using single cut carbide burrs for aluminum cases. They can cut quickly and are less prone to clogging than double cut burrs. An occasional spray of WD-40 helps to reduce clogging as well. Choose burr shapes that work well with what you're doing. I like these cylindrical burrs with dome tops for a lot of general purpose work, but some find that flame or tapered bits work better for them. I usually buy these in sets of 10 on eBay or Amazon fairly cheap, so it's not tough to experiment a little bit and to see what works for you. Whatever bits you choose, just be aware of what you're cutting. Pay attention and keep working toward the shape that you want. You can see here that I'm working on digging a trench from the reed area to the transfer area and trying to make a path that heads up toward the transfers. Stop frequently to clear chips away and examine your progress. Look at pictures or videos of porting that you wish to emulate as you go to make sure that you're on the right track. Here's a look at the first spot where I broke totally through the aluminum cases and into the filler. You can use that to give you an idea of how deep you are and how much deeper you want to go. Usually once you see filler you shouldn't cut much deeper in that area. The more of the cases that you leave intact, the more likely they'll be to have a long life without cracking. I've done enough cases by now to know to expect breaking through a bit worse than this, so I kept working on the area, but I still didn't try to dig down much more. It's also not a bad idea to leave a little extra meat so you can do final shaping later without cutting away more than you want. I started focusing on cutting the trench wider, expanding it up toward the base area. Going very wide with the trenches on these Minarelli cases will mean that you're going to break through into the cylinder stud pockets. You can see here that I've just started to get into the stud hole. I try not to go too much farther than what you see here, but I will take a little more off as the porting continues. Be aware that if you break through into the stud passages, you then must use a sealant on your studs to prevent leaks around them. I've always used a small amount of Permatex Forma Gasket No. 2 on each of the studs when I assemble the engine, and it's worked well for me. At this point my trench is pretty well roughed out. I've got a nice wide pathway heading toward the transfer port where it will meet up with the cylinder. The trench is mostly blended into the transfer area, but you may notice that I have a ledge at the bottom of the trench here. 
I'll be doing some more filling later in hopes of creating an even smoother passage toward the cylinder transfers, so I left this area alone for now. I switched over to roughly port matching the case to the cylinder. For this job, try to keep your burr at an angle so you're removing a little more at the base surface than you are deeper in the cases. Try to blend as you go, again being careful not to dig a transfer that just goes straight down. Keep it tapered so the cylinder base is the largest part of the opening. I also try to keep blending the transition from the trench to the transfer as I'm matching the edge nearest the trench. It's a good idea to leave some extra material at this stage so that you have material to work with as you shape nearby areas and so you don't have to worry about accidentally going too far when everything is smooth. You could grind right up to the edge now, but you would have to be very careful not to touch these areas later. From there, I continued to blend and smooth any areas that looked like they needed it. Now the roughing in is pretty much finished, but I have some other work to do. I wanted to fill the floor of the transfer area in an attempt to better aim the flow into the ports. I roughed up the area that I wanted to apply JB Weld to with a scribe. Then I removed any debris and cleaned the area with acetone. I propped up the case in a way that would let the JB Weld pull where I wanted it. JB Weld will hold its form to some degree, but you'll get a better result by spending the time to position the case so gravity is more in your favor. You can test with water to see how it wants to pull if necessary, just make sure you give it time to dry. I wanted the most filling in the corner away from the trench, and I wanted to create a slope from the floor toward the roof. I try to give the JB Weld about 24 hours before I work with it, so I started working on the other case half. I won't go into detail here because it's essentially the same process. The next day, the filler was cured so I could get back to work. I used a carbide burr to shape the filler to direct flow and blend it in. Then I did some hand sanding with 150 grit to shape and smooth the filler. A quick check with a finger may let you feel some things that you can't easily see. I made a few revisions after carefully checking my porting, and then hand sanded the whole area to smooth it out. Once I was satisfied with the shaping and finish, I cleaned the case again and applied a couple of dabs of JB Weld to fill imperfections. A quick smoothing as shown can reduce effort later. I gave the other case half the same treatment before letting the touch-ups in both cure.
Before going any further, I installed the studs and cylinder to make sure the cylinder skirts wouldn't hit the filler and it checked out fine. A quick bit of hand sanding should be all that's needed to finish off the additional filler. Then I worked on matching the boost port area. I cut most of the way to the top edge with a carbide burr and rounded the corner that leads into the case instead of leaving an abrupt edge. I used flat files after the burr because I find it easier to get a nice straight edge that way. This edge was rounded off as well. I looked the case over and decided that I wanted to try to blend the trench into the reed area a little better, so I got the carbide cutter out again and did a little more work. I repeated the process on the larger case half, but found that I did have clearance issues with the cylinder skirts on that side and had to remove a little of the filler to make it fit. Then I removed the tape and bolted the cases together. My port matching was left unfinished earlier, and when I cleaned the cases to prep for JB Weld application, it erased the marks showing what needed to be removed. I installed the studs and gasket and made new marks to show the mismatch. I filed the roof of the boost port while the cases were still together so I could get a nice clean line where the cases meet. You may also want to look at where the cases meet up at the rear or the inside of the boost port area to see if they need any work to match them up while the cases are together. Next, I took the cases back apart and got close to the edges of the marks with a carbide burr before switching to a sanding drum to create a more uniform finish. You may notice that I didn't go all the way to the edges of the marks. That's because I don't think a perfect match is possible because there's slop in the fit of the studs through the passages in the cylinder. Dowel pins or larger studs or something along those lines would have to be used to remove the play if you want a spot on match between the cases and cylinder. I used the drum to smooth out other areas of aluminum that needed it as well. Then I switched to 150 and 220 grit sandpaper to do some final blending and smoothing. I don't put a lot of focus on the surface finish. I just look for basically smooth. I don't think polishing would offer any benefit and may even be detrimental. After I was satisfied with the finish, I blew out the dust from sanding and then washed the cases with soap and water. Here's what I ended up with. It's certainly not a perfect job and could be worked more to remove all imperfections, but I don't think there's really a point to that for me. As I said early in the video, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all setup here, and it has worked well for me like this. I'll put a link in the description so you can check out some pics of casework by other members of the 49ccscoot.com forum. 
If you found the video to be helpful or interesting, please give it a like and subscribe for more if you haven't already. Thanks for watching.